but in 2007, uh, the Border Patrol decided that I needed to go to Washington, D.C. And so we ended up in Manassas, Virginia. And uh, we hadn't been going to church for a long time. And we just decided that we had some teenage boys. We need to get them better. We need to get them connected to God. And we felt that maybe we might start losing them, and we just couldn't do it on our own. So we decided we're going to go back to church. I grew up in an AG church in Prescott, Arizona. And so I looked in a phone book and found a church in Manassas. And so we ended up there. And it, that day changed our lives. And three years later, I felt the call to ministry and uh, mostly working in, in chaplaincy, things of that nature for uh, for the law enforcement community. Because cops are a closed community and they don't like to talk to anybody that doesn't understand their roles. And so it was real easy for me to step into that role. And so I've been doing that for a couple of years. This is my last class um, for my education requirements. Um, and. Luckily, uh, the Arizona District put me in touch with Pastor Keith, and he was gracious enough to allow me to, to tag along and, and learn some things from him. And so he's given me this opportunity to share his pulpit tonight, and I want to thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. So as, as he said, this is the first time I've, I'm preaching a sermon. I've, I've taught Bible classes before. Um, I talk in front of employees all the time. I'm actually an assistant chief of the Border Patrol, so I'm having problems talking to people. But this is the first time I've actually written a sermon from the beginning to end. So that's what's got me nervous, and we're going to get started. Hopefully I'm not talking in circles and you understand where I'm coming from. When I get nervous, I talk fast. I'm going to try to slow that down. Although, Keith did me a favor by going long. I'll be able to get it all in. So, tonight, yeah, Keith asked me to talk about about joy and rejoicing in the Lord. And so we're going to be looking at the, um, at the text in Philippians 4, chapter 4, 4 through 9, if you, if you, if you want to follow along. Um, and so I put it up here for you. I know that uh, a lot of us carry iPads and, and things of that nature in our Bible. But to me, it was always easier just to see what the pastor was reading. And I'm, I'm going off of the, the, the New International Version. So I'm just going to read this to you. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned from me, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Hmm. So the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Philippians, to the believers in the church of Philippi. Now Philippi, at the time, it was, on, it was on the western edge of the Roman territory. Um, this was a very significant post. Now most of the people that lived there were retired military personnel. They were given land for, because of their, their duties in the military to prosper the place and to protect it. And so the people that were there really liked the fact that they were Romans. So they dressed like Romans, they acted like Romans, and they, it, was, it, was, it was a big deal for them to do that. But for the believers that were, in, that were in Philippi, it was really difficult for them to assimilate that from that background into now being believers in Jesus and doing what, what they needed to do to be faithful. So it was difficult for them. Scholars believe that Paul wrote this letter about A.D. 61. And what's curious about this is that Paul is, is writing to encourage them because of the difficulties they're in. But in fact, at the time that he writes this, he's actually in, he's under house arrest in Rome while he's writing this, writing this letter to the Philippians. So I, you know, I, you, you go back and you look, you think about that. Here is somebody that's already in jail, yet he's writing to believers to encourage them. Hmm. So I think that's a significant thing that we need to, we need to kind of think about. But, it, but it's not the only thing that Paul's done. He's been in and out of jail for almost six years at this point in his life. Um, 
he had been, he, he was, on a daily basis, he was worried about being killed by his enemies. Uh, he was stoned and left for dead. And he was stoned because he had, he had healed a girl. And the people in the area thought that he was God and they wanted to worship Paul. And Paul refused. And so they decided that they needed to stone him because he wasn't grateful. And what's really interesting to me at that point in time is that it wasn't very far back in Paul's history that he was the guy that was chasing um, the disciples around and the believers around. Yeah. And he was there when Stephen was stoned. And he was inciting the people to do that. So, you know, if you, if you step back and you think about Paul's mindset at the time that he's being stoned, he's probably thinking, you know, God's, God's getting me back. You know, this is bad karma. Finally, <laughs> finally resting on me. Yet he doesn't die. And... And so he moves on. And, and so we start to see a pattern where Paul is put in some pretty difficult situations. It's not very long that he starts receiving beatings. In fact, he was, he was beaten several times. And, and I want to, to kind of get, you, get us a picture of that. Because it's for, for me, thinking about a beating um, is the spanking I got from my parents when I had misbehaved. And that's not what it was. It was, it was actually crowds of people with, with rods that were made out of tree branches or cane stalks. And somebody would incite this crowd against somebody and then they would beat him and beat him to the point where he couldn't stand and couldn't even breathe. To the point where you thought you were gonna die. So being beaten is, is a, you know, again, is one of those things where you're to the point where you're probably gonna die. And yet Paul continues in his ministry and in, 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 in his mission work. On Paul's first visit to Philippi, when he start, when he began at church, he was thrown in jail. And and I want I want us to also picture what prison was like then. It's not like what we what we see now. And I'm I'm in a jail every day. And it's not that's not what it was back then. Back then it was it was a holding area that was maybe a pit, it may be a room with no windows, it may be a basement. But prisons were not made for people to stay in. They weren't sentenced to prison. If, if whatever you were being um, accused of, if it wasn't, a, the penalty wouldn't likely result in death, they were generally exiled from their community to live a life of a beggar um, or just an outsider. But if it was something that were death would probably be the likely sentence, then they were thrown into this hole, into this room that would be covered in sewage, was covered in and garbage, and they were there for a short amount of time, long enough to have a trial, and then generally be killed on the same day. And the killings were beheadings, um, crucifixion, um, dismemberment. So this wasn't a nice place, and yet Paul was in prison. And this time in Philippi, the Bible tells us that he was chained to the floor, and, and God rescues him by causing an earthquake that shakes the foundations of this prison, and it breaks his chains. And, and the Bible tells us that the jailer wakes up and, and realizes that the prison has been opened and the prisoners are likely free. And, you know, by reading into that, coming from the law enforcement side, the jailer was asleep. He wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. <laughs> right. Um, and so he woke up and he draws his sword to kill himself because, you know, he realized he's failed his duty and his masters are probably going to do worse to him than they were going to do to Paul. And at that point in time, Paul calls out to him and says, don't do that. Um, we're all still here. All the prisoners still, are still here. And the Bible tells us that the jailer runs in and falls to Paul's feet, trembling, knowing that God has saved Paul from his, from his faith and yet has protected him. And he asks Paul, how do I know your God? How do I be saved? And the jailer takes him home and Paul preaches to his family, his whole family accepts Christ and is baptized. So, again, through all these difficulties, the Lord has given Paul opportunities to be, to minister. And he has this great attitude on everything that he's doing with this and all these trials, things that happen. So, 
So, and Paul continues to have to have these these things. He's the Jewish religious leadership tries to tries to assassinate him in in, in Jerusalem, um, and the the Roman guards actually find out about this. They whisk him out of town, take him to um, Caesarea, where the governor is, to protect Paul. And so we see time and again that the secular world is also protecting Paul, which is part of God's plan. And it gives it, this gives Paul an opportunity to give his testimony to two Roman governors and a, and a king that he never would have had the opportunity to had he not started in prison. So that's five ground on Paul, and this is where Paul's coming from when he's telling people, you need to rejoice in the Lord always. Look at the things that have happened to me. And yet, I still have this positive attitude. In Philippians 4.13, Paul writes, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And he's referring to all these trials and, and desperate times that he's had. And yet, he knows that he is, that God has called him. And that his every breath is to serve the Lord. And so he finds, he finds things to find joy in. And although he's writing this letter from house arrest in Rome, which is, he was basically kept in a house, he wasn't allowed to leave, but he wasn't in chains. And he was allowed to receive visitors, and he was allowed to give, or allowed to preach and share the gospel. And he did that with many people that normally would not have the opportunity, excuse me, to, to hear the message because they wouldn't go to a church, they wouldn't go to a synagogue. So God pre prepared him for this. And he had to provide for his needs. So... So also during this time, he's telling Philippians, thank you for supporting me. They have sent him an offering to help pay for his basic survival needs. And they continue to pray for him, and the messages go back and forth. So Paul has a lot to be thankful for. <coughs> Yet he knows that all the suffering that's happening is going to happen to everybody else. And he, and he comes back to us and tells us that. In Philippians 1, 27-30, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This will be a sign, by those who oppose, this will be a sign to them that you will be saved, and that by God. Paul's telling them that they need to live a life that's worthy of Christ. He tells, he tells the Philippians that they must live as a reflection of Christ so that others will know that they don't fear the world around them, that they don't fear being persecuted. Verses 29 and 30 say, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw that I have, and I now hear that I still have. Paul knows that they're being persecuted for their faith. And that he's, he's been sharing in that. And he's writing to tell them about it. Not, not looking for sympathy, but to tell them that you can find the good in this situation. You are going to have problems in your life. But you can survive them. And you can find the joy in what the Lord is doing for you. So let's talk a little bit more about what we're gonna, about the text. And we're going to go to Philippians 4.5. It says, let your gentleness be evident to, the, to all. The Lord is near. Again, Paul's just reiterating back to what he said in chapter, chapter 1, verse 27 through 30, that we must act and live so that others see Christ in us and that the Lord is near, that the Lord is coming. He's faithful. He's coming, and he's coming soon. And in those days, they were expecting the Lord to come any day. They expected it to happen in their lifetime. And we know 2,000 years later that that hasn't happened yet. Yep. Our days are not the same as the Lord's days. And so He may come tonight and He may come tomorrow. And we need to have our hearts ready for it and we need to be prepared. We need to stay the course. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Paul's telling us, we got to pray. We have to go. We have to go to God in prayer. Prayer is the equalizer. And then we need to ask Him. Ask Him for our needs. Tell Him what we need. The Lord knows what we need, but He also wants to hear from us. 
Ask Him what we need. And God, sh and, and Paul shows us that He does this. Prayer and thanksgiving are the antidote for ex for an anxiety and worry. Amen. If you're praying right. and you're and you're seeking the Lord and you're focusing on Him, your troubles are going to be your troubles, and you can't do anything about that. But you can find the joy yeah. in whatever is happening in your life, even with the loss of a loved one. Something is there. You know, um, Pastor talked about some members that have lost a loved one this this week. But the joy in that is he's gone. He's 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 in heaven. He's at home. He's where we want to be. And it's hard right now because we're not there and we can't share that with him. But he's not in pain anymore. And you know that's very comforting to me. Verse seven. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. By laying our burdens at the feet of our Lord, His feet, His peace will fill us beyond all our understanding. It's, it's beyond anything we can comprehend in this world. It transcends all understanding. There, we can't understand why or how this is going to work. We just have to have faith and we have to believe and we have to know that God is going to, is going to fill us. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Wow. Paul gives us quite a list of positive virtues. Paul knows that the world is going to creep into whatever situation it is. We can be praising the Lord, and that thought will come in. And if we're really in trying times, it's going to try to take over. So think on the good things. Try to focus on those things. Praise the Lord in all that you do. If we focus on our trials, if we lose sight of the Lord and we focus on what's happening in our lives at that moment, we will slip deeper into despair and our sorrow will get worse. But if we concentrate on the good, then things will change. Amen. In verse 9, Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul follows this up in verse 9 by reminding us that he set the example, that he's lived these things. He's been through these really tough times. And he's telling us not to think about these things, or not just to only think about these things, but to act on them as well. If we occupy our time and our minds on the positive, they will in turn determine our words and our actions. And when we do that, we will find the joy in every situation. So, I want to share a little story with you um, about a young couple in love. They'd recently gone through some hard times. One of them had lost a loved one, um, had, they had intended to marry. The other one had been, had been harmed physically by their loved one. And so, it was so bad that it was really hard for them to commit. And, and to decide on what the future would be. In fact, uh, because of those, those, those bad situations, figured out that marriage may not, may not really be for them, or it may not be what the fairy tale says. But somehow they found, this couple finds themselves engaged. Um, they're writing their vows, and today is the day. So let me set the stage for you. An outdoor wedding in January. Luckily, it's in southern Arizona, so it's not so bad. <laughs> it's a picture-perfect day. This, it's a nice, there's just some clouds, and passing clouds in the sky. The sun, the sun is bright, and it's warm, and if you're standing in the sun, it, it, it warms your skin. The mountains that are in close proximity have a light dusting of snow. The grass, although it's dormant, is a nice color of dormant green. It's been taken well care of. There's a lake in the background, just a stone's throw away, nice and tranquil and peaceful. 
and there's the wedding arch, completely decorated in colorful streamers. There's about 200 people there that have gathered around, friends and family, to witness this solemn occasion. But we're going to take a step back, and I want you to focus on the altar. And we see the young man standing there. Yet there's nobody there. There's no bride. The bride hasn't shown. So he addresses the gathering in an attempt to allay their fears. Because he doesn't have any. He knows that God has brought this woman into his life and that she's his angel, and there is no real concern for the delay. Yet 30 minutes go by, and the crowd's still with him. They still think maybe she's coming. An hour has gone by now, and still no word. But he's steadfast. He's, he knows she's coming. Something must have delayed her. She, she didn't leave him. Yet now we're at two hours. I think everybody else in the crowd knows she's not coming. But he hasn't figured it out yet. He's not willing to bend. But all of a sudden, there seems to be some kind of noise coming off from the background. And here the bride walks through the entryway, nice and calm, like nothing had ever happened, and she was here on time. There was, it was a great ceremony, a lot of celebration and rejoicing. And, and in my mind, just like a Disney fairy tale. And friends, that was my wedding. <laughs> and uh, my lovely wife is still here, almost 20 years later. But, and why I wanted to tell that story is that although she was late and she was gone for a while, I knew in my heart that this was the woman that God had, had chosen for me. And there was no doubt in my mind. Um, when I was trying to tell some jokes, I. I, but I knew she was coming, and there was something going on. And, and there was a little emergency in town that had me take care of. But she showed, and, and it's been a wonderful ride since that time. And I've had some difficulties in my life, although none of them have been great, as great as the trials that Paul has had, or that our missionaries around the world are facing today. But I think that the Lord had all of that taken care of, all well in advance, for Paul, for me and for you. And he set Paul's life as an example to show us that how bad things can be, and yet he's got a plan for us. And that we can find the joy in the situation if we choose to focus on him. I encourage you tonight that, like Paul did to the Philippians almost 2,000 years ago, to rejoice in the Lord, always. God's word continues to speak the truth and be relevant to us today. Paul's life is evidence in the scripture detailed the extremes of what the world can throw at us. But Paul chooses to trust in God and to give him praise and rejoice in every season. I want you to choose to reflect and act on the virtuous things that Paul's talked about in verse 8. Remember that whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things, and you will find joy in your life. Pastor, I'm done. <laughs>